All right. So I'd like us to turn, please, if we could, to the book of Judges again in chapter uh, 13. And we're going to read from verse 8. And uh, we'll take the time to read to the end of the chapter. We're going to be learning about both the prayer and worship of Manoah, uh, the father of Samson. And so we can get a little bit of an insight into his home life. And so it says in verse 8, then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God, which thou didst send, come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? And uh, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? So Manoah took a kid with a meal offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord and the angel did wondrously and Manoah and his wife looked on for it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar and Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground but the angel of the Lord did not more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said unto him, if the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meal offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would as at this time have told us such things as these. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. So we, we get a little glimpse really into the family life of Samson. And the first thing that we notice is that uh, Manoah, his father, uh, is a man of prayer, and he offers a prayer, and it's an excellent request. And uh, again, I think there's a lot of practical things here for those that uh, are involved in child training. And again, most of us on this call are probably uh, past that or beyond that, but uh, we can pass this on to others that have children, uh, the younger generation, because it is a solemn thing. Uh, to raise a family for God. And so in verse 8, Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again to us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that is born. And so he, he really is asking, okay, you're going to bless us with this special child. Uh, show us how, how can we instruct it? How can we teach this child? How can we uh, raise it? We need help to raise him uh, the way that you would instruct us, the way you want us to do it. And again, what an excellent desire. 
uh, to raise children according to God's instructions. And he does have instructions for us in the word of God. And, and so, uh, he, again, we see the same thing in verse 12, uh, where speaking to the man, he says, the end of verse 12, how shall we order the child? How shall we do unto him? And so, <clears throat> again, what, a, what a, an encouragement uh, for, uh, for us to pray. Uh, pray uh, the camp here. Where there's a lot of young families and uh, it's wonderful to see them bringing their children to be under the sound of the word of God, but how we need to pray for them uh, as they seek to raise children in this incredibly difficult age. And just, just as this is a difficult age, the time of judges was a difficult age. And, and so here's uh, Manoah and he's praying for help to know how to raise this child. And again, I, I want to just say too, what an encouragement uh, that Samson is going to be born into a home where the father knows something about prayer. Again, what a, what a great example. And especially because when we see the background and the context of this day of departure, uh, Samson was privileged to be raised into a home where prayer was made. And, uh, and so this man does pray. And he says, uh, again, back in verse eight, he says, Manoah treated the Lord, said, oh, my Lord, let the man of God, which thou did send come again to us and teach us what shall what we shall do to the child that shall be born. I want you to notice not only is he praying, but he has absolute faith that what had been announced, even though his wife was barren, would come to pass. He's a man, not only of prayer, but a man whose prayer is accompanied by absolute confidence in God that he's able to do what he promises. And so he, he knows this child is going to be born. He's absolute confident uh, in the promises of God. And just like Abraham in Romans 4, 21, he was fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And so again, he, Samson is born into a home of prayer and a home of faith. And that's great, isn't it? I mean, again, how we want to pray for our younger generation, that they would be homes that would be characterized by prayer and faith in the promises of God. That's a beautiful environment to be brought into the world in a home such as that. And then we notice in verse nine, just a simple point, but profound nevertheless, and God hearkened to the voice of of Manoah. And isn't it wonderful that we have a God that delights to hear and answer prayer? <laughs> and he does listen. And uh, his, his ears are, are open to the cries of his children. Uh, he's not hard of hearing. Uh, he's able to hear and he delights to answer those that come to him believing who he is and that he's able to do. Uh, what he promises. So God hearkened to the voice of Manoah and the angel of God came again unto the woman and she sat in the field. And again, isn't it interesting that although Manoah is praying, yet the angel again appears to the woman, this unnamed woman that we talked about last week, that her, na she, her name is never mentioned. And, and yet uh, again, surely the spirit of God is showing the significance of the role of the woman in that it's her, even though she's not named, that the angel appears to once again. And so uh, the woman, of course, uh, because she is in subjection to a husband and she wants him to be involved in this whole process, uh, it says in verse 10, she, she made haste, she ran, she showed her husband, said to him, behold, the man uh, that appeared uh, hath appeared to me that came to me the other day. And so Manoah uh, rises, went with his wife, verse 11, came to the man, said to him, art thou the man that spake us to the woman? And he said, I am. And of course, Manoah asked this question that we've already referred to. How shall we order the child? How shall we do unto him? And again, there's this absolute confidence. The child is going to be given. The, despite the seeming impossibility of a barren womb, there's confidence that God is going to do this, and there's this desire to know how shall we order the child, how shall we do unto him? And so the answer that is given in verse 13 uh, may seem a little bit strange. The angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, let her beware. And so 
first of all, we see this headship here. Your responsibility, Manoah, is to make sure that everything I said to the woman, she does it. In other words, she's going to work through that headship authority of the man. Your job as the, the head is to make sure your wife complies with the instructions that I've given. And God always works through headship order. And, it's, and of course, there's, uh, there's responsibility, but there's, uh, <laughs> there's also accountability there. It's always the head that is accountable. And so we were just talking this week about uh, uh, the woman was first in the transgression. And yet God holds the man responsible through one man. Sin entered into the world and death by sin because he never sidesteps headship order. And so his job, Manoah's job, is to make sure that the wife complies with the commands that had been given her. And of course, the commands that had been given her was to do with herself, her own conduct, that she was to abstain uh, from wine and strong drink and any unclean thing. And so uh, one thing that the home has to be, uh, if uh, this child is to be right, raised in a right way, it has to be a home that's separated to God, like a Nazarite type home to raise a Nazarite type child. She can drink wine, uh, eat the fruit of the vine, and then expect her son not to. And so again, we need to, uh, it's kind of interesting uh, today, uh, we need to make sure that we're consistent in what we're asking our children to do. For instance, one of the big challenges for today's generation, and I know my, my grandchildren, uh, this is a big issue, is screen time. Our children are mesmerized by screens and they can get into all kinds of trouble with screens. So my son tries to very much restrict their screen time. But if mom and dad are on the screen all the time, it's not giving a good example, you see. So they've got to not only not allow the children to do it, but they can't be mesmerized by it themselves either, right? So they've got to set the example. And so the whole idea here is that, uh, that Manoah and his wife are to set the, the tone in the home. And it's unreasonable to expect conduct from the children that the parents are unwilling to do themselves. And so her responsibility, it quite clearly, uh, as we saw previously, is for her to be separated. Uh, back in verse 7, uh, he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive, bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And again, what a challenge to us. You can't expect conduct in your children that you're not following yourself. <laughs> uh, we've got to set the example, right? That's the, the idea of a Christian home is setting the tone, setting the example. And so certainly... <clears throat> this is the instruction uh, that the angel gives. Let her beware of all that I said to the woman. Let her beware. Let her take it seriously. She may not, verse 14, eat of anything that comes of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I command, let her observe. And again, we would say this, that maybe a Christian home is different to the average home in Canadian or US society, because there are things that in an ordinary home people can do without batting an eyelid. But in a Christian home, there are things that are not appropriate for a home that is under Christ's, as it were, uh, influence. And so it, there's a separation from, there's, there's things that are to be uh, kept from in the Christian home uh, that are not to be uh, seen in the Christian home, and especially the unclean thing, uh, that should not be seen at all. Anything unclean, anything that's corrupting, uh, that will corrupt the heart of the child must be absent from such a home. And so then it says in verse 15, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And I don't know whether Manoah is influenced by the word of God. Remember Abraham and his angelic visitor, and he wanted to prepare a kid and uh, feed them. 
and uh, <clears throat> perhaps that was perhaps at the back of his mind. Uh, but in this instance, it says in verse 16, the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou will offer a burn offering, thou must offer it to the Lord, for Manoah knew not that he was the angel of the Lord. So it brings out the second feature of what a godly home is like. A godly home is a place where there's absence of things that the family have determined to separate themselves from. They're not part of that home. They might be part of the average home, but they're not part of that home. But it's not all about what we don't do that makes a home a Christian home. There's the other side, what we do do that is absent from other homes. And that is that it's a home where worship is offered to the Lord. And so uh, family worship, the family altar, for instance, this idea. And so this home, as well as being known for what it's not there, there's no wine, there's no strong drink in this home, there's no unclean thing in this home. There are things that might be in every other home, but are not in this home. But also, there's a lingering smell of a sacrifice in this home. There's worship made in this home. There's appreciation of Christ as seen in the burnt offering and <clears throat> in the meal offering. And so there's this, uh, this home where worship is made. And again, it's a, a tragic thing uh, that... Uh, there seems to be a decline because of the busyness of life. There seems to be a tremendous decline in what we call the family altar. Uh, one of the things I've deeply appreciated about uh, brethren from South India, I've been in many a uh, home. In fact, this, uh, this Saturday night, I'll be staying in the home of an Indian couple. And I'll guarantee that in that home Saturday evening, before we go to bed, there'll be family worship. It's just, a, it's just a way of life in those South Indian homes. And they're doing a wonderful job of raising their children for the Lord because not only is there separation from, there's a separation too. There's this, this giving place to family worship. And so we read again in verse 15, uh, <clears throat> uh, 16, the angel Lord said to Manoah, uh, I will not eat of thy bread, but if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it to the Lord. So Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is thy name that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And again, there's another uh, confession of the faith of Manoah. Yeah, he wants to know more details uh, about the name of the, the angel, but nevertheless, there's absolute confidence uh, we want to honor you when your sayings come to pass. And so, again, we just see this deep faith in Manoah, uh, not like Zechariah when uh, the angel appeared to him uh, concerning Elizabeth, uh, where there was a doubt. Here, there's no doubt. There's absolute confidence. And so we want to honor you. What is your name? Of course, we, we looked at this a little bit last time. The angel of the Lord said to him, why askest thou after my name, seeing it is secret? And uh, we saw elsewhere that that uh, word secret is translated uh, wonderful. And of course, uh, this is a manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ. And we often say, His, he is wonderful. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. And he is wonderful. And we, we should never lose the wonder, not only of the work of Christ, but of the person of Christ. Uh, that should constantly thrill our souls. And so uh, it, it's secret. It's wonderful. So Manoah took a kid uh, with a meal offering and offered it upon a rock to the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. Again, connected, same uh, connection with the word secret here, did wondrously. And M Manoah and his wife looked on and you can just imagine as they witness this event now he's going to detail what he means by the angel doing wondrously but again it's the same word as secret in verse 18 the angel did wondrously for it came to pass when the flame went up towards heaven from off the altar that the angel of the lord ascended in the flame of the altar and Menorah and his wife looked on it 
and fell on their faces to the ground. And again, it's another idea that this is Christ uh, in his pre-incarnate form. And true worship, in a sense, is bringing Christ before the Father, isn't it? This idea of ascending, the Son ascending to the Father. When we pray, what do we do? We, we bring the, the aroma of Christ before the Father in heaven. And that's such a delight to him, uh, because uh, this world is filled with the, the stench of sin and self-will. And oh, what a contrast to bring to the Father the meal offering, the, the, the perfections of the person of the Lord Jesus, no rough edges, uh, perfect in every way, uh, the, the burnt offering, his devotion to the Father's will, even to the death of the cross. And so as we, as we worship, what do we do? We, we bring to the Father that which pleases him most, and that is uh, his lovely son. And so he ascended in the flame of the altar, and Manoah and his wife looked on, and they fell on their faces to the ground. Remember, the word worship literally has the idea of to prostrate. Uh, and so they, they're just in awe. They're worshiping. Uh, they're, they're on the ground. And the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah, to his wife, than Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. He knew that this was uh, this special manifestation of the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, uh, the uh, none other than this Christophany or the pre-incarnate Christ. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. Now, again, let's just think about that. Uh, again, it's another affirmation of the deity of the Lord Jesus. And he wasn't wrong in what he said, We've, in, in the sense that we have seen God. Uh, he was correct in that. He was wrong in the assumption that he was going to die because he'd seen God. And there's certainly that sense uh, in the Jewish mind uh, they, they believed that nobody could look upon God and live. That was common understanding of the Jews. If you look back at chapter 6 of Judges and verse 22 and 23, you get a similar idea. When Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And so, he, again, he was fearful. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen God. What's going to happen? And the Lord said to him, peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. But again, he was thinking, I'm going to die. I've, I've seen, the, as it were, the, uh, seen God. And so that certainly is what Manoah is thinking. Uh, but sometimes a good wife can talk common sense into us when we're getting it wrong. And so notice that Manoah's wife uh, says in verse 23, but his wife said to him, if the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burn offering and a meal offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would as at this time have told us such things as these. And so <clears throat> using common sense, she convinces her husband that they couldn't die and fulfill God's promise at the same time, right? The promise that she's going to have a child, the promise that this child is going to be a Nazarite from his womb. If God is going to kill them because he's seen them, then that would scupper all the promises. And so uh, she tells him this, uh, there, there's no way God would do that. And uh, she, I believe, uh, had insight to appreciate the grace of God would never bring his people to such a point and then slay them. She understood that. She understood that the purpose of his grace was to begin to effect deliverance. Remember, he was going to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. And so she knew that. She believed that. And she knew that God would not kill them until that purpose that they had you know, they, in other words, they were immortal until their work on earth was done. And I think there's a, there's a, uh, many of the Lord's people would feel that way that until the Lord's fulfilled his purpose in our lives, we're immortal. And then when our purpose is finished, then we're ready for home. But, and certainly that was 
how she understood things. And so um, we can also uh, look back to Manoah's sacrifice on the rock, and we can see pictures of, of Christ in all of this. Uh, again, we've already said the burnt offering uh, speaks of him uh, fully devoted to the will of his father, even to death. Uh, the meal offering speaking of the perfection, the fragrance of his perfect life. All of it points back. Uh, to that lovely person, the Lord Jesus. And as, again, as we think of what a Christian home should be, and as we would have opportunity to speak to young couples, uh, we want to encourage them that a Christian home looks like this. There are things that are not appropriate for a Christian home that may be appropriate in an ordinary home, uh, things that we separate from. But there are some things that are in a Christian home that are not in an ordinary home. It's a place where prayer is want to be made. It's a place where family worship takes place. And so these are things that we need to encourage and especially encourage the family altar. And, uh, you know, I do think part of the role of shepherds is to uh, visit uh, the young couples in the assembly and to encourage them uh, in raising their children for God. Uh, books that are helpful for them to read. I've been talking to some of the people here about uh, books that were very helpful with our own children when they were younger, uh, daily devotionals we did with them, uh, uh, books, little biographies that were helpful. And I think it's always good to seek to pass on that which is going to help people to raise a family for God, especially in this uh, this difficult time, just like the time of the judges, I feel very similar, great similarities. And so great practical lessons here. So we come to the birth of Samson. It says, the woman bare a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. Samson, as we've already said, means sunny or sunlight or brightness. And no doubt he brought sunshine into this home. Uh, that had so long been childless. And you can imagine, especially in that Jewish culture where it was such a reproach to not have children, uh, to have this, this little boy born as a, into this home. And uh, I'm sure that uh, he was the sunshine of their lives. And so uh, they, they, they called him Sonny. And um, in a sense, he was not only to bring some sunshine into their lives, but he was also set apart to bring light into the darkness of the evil days of judges. Uh, he was to be, a, he was meant to be set apart to be a light for God in a dark, dark time. And so that's what his name means. And the sad thing about it really is that the man that was to be sunny died in darkness with his eyes put out by the Philistines. And it was kind of a sad ending, really. We'll see that when we get to chapter 16 and verse 21. What a contrast with the Lord Jesus, because uh, he's just, he's going to get brighter and brighter. And the verse that I have in mind, and one that we've studied previously, when we looked at the book of Malachi, if you look at the last book of the Old Testament, lovely scripture, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, speaking again of our blessed Lord Jesus, and what it says concerning him is not going to be any diminishing of his sunshine, his glory, his brightness, but unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. And again, the sun of righteousness. And again, I believe that what was seen on Transfiguration Mount where the Lord Jesus shining brilliantly in all his glory. This is what's going to be seen in the coming day when the Lord Jesus comes back to reign on the earth. And remember that even uh, Saul of Tarsus, when he saw the Lord Jesus on that uh, road to Damascus, uh, he said that his, his visage was, was greater than the midday sun in the Middle East. <laughs> such is the radiant glory of the Lord Jesus. And yes, there'll be no diminishing of that glory at all. Such will be his brightness. 
And so <clears throat> it says the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And again, the Lord will bless this kind of home where the children are set apart for God and his service, uh, where there is prayer, where there is worship. It says the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And again, we get a little similarity uh, to the Lord Jesus in that this is all we get of Samson's childhood. Right. It's interesting, isn't it, that his growing years, his developing years, we don't we really don't have anything other than this. The child grew and the Lord blessed him. And I don't know if it immediately jumps to your mind, but you remember the Lord Jesus, the 30 years, uh, what we call the the silent years where we know very little about what happened in that home in Nazareth. We just get one little glimpse in Luke's gospel, chapter two and verse 41 uh, down to verse 51. And we'll just take the time to read it. But this is, this is all you get of the upbringing of the Lord Jesus. It says his parents went to Jerusalem every year in the feast of the Passover. So again, they were a faithful couple. They, they understood the responsibilities uh, that were theirs to be at the feasts. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of that feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. Isn't it amazing that they went a whole day without any consciousness of the presence of the Lord Jesus? That's not a good thing to do, is it? We should never go a whole day without an awareness of the presence of the Lord Jesus in our lives. A whole day's journey. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. You know, one thing that it tells us is when we lose a sense of the presence of the Lord, when we, when we recognize it and we want to put it right, it's not necessarily an instant fix. It took three days. <laughs> and sometimes when we're out of fellowship with the Lord and we've lost his sense of his presence, we think instantaneously, I can get it back. But no, it doesn't. You don't go back to the same place. And there was this delay of three days before they finally found him. And what did they find him doing? Well, he's in the temple. He's dialoguing, discussing uh, with the doctors, uh, hearing them and asking them questions. And all, verse 47, that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said to them, how is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And what, what we get here is the idea, some some liberal theologians give this idea that the messianic idea kind of gradually came upon the Lord Jesus. That's utter nonsense. He knew who he was and he knew why he was here. And at 12 years of age, it's very clear in his mind. Did you not realize I should be about my father's business? And certainly uh, that is really a picture of his life. He is here for one purpose. He's here about his father's business to do his work and, and to do his will and finish his work. And so it says, they understood not the saying which he spake to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And that's it. That's all we get. I mean, people have tried to fill in the, the gaps of those 30 years and all kinds of apocryphal literature is being written uh, and all the rest of it. But the Spirit of God doesn't want us to know that. All we know is, if you want a summary of what those 30 years look like, when the Lord Jesus is baptized, you hear the affirmation from heaven. This is what that 30 years looked like. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What he did in that home in those 30 years was pleasing to the father. And that's enough. That's all we need to know. And so we're, we're reminded in Samson that we don't get all the details 
a whole week. We get a sense of what the home was like, uh, but we don't get any details. It just says he, the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And then in verse uh, 25, it says, and the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. We see now that the spirit of the Lord is beginning to move with this Nazarite, this man who's been set apart for God. And I want you to notice there's a few times that we're going to see the spirit of the Lord coming upon Samson. So if you look again in chapter uh, 14, notice verse 6, it says the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Uh, look, verse 19. It says, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went down to Ashkelon, uh, verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 14. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And so that's why it tells us here that the spirit of the Lord began to move him and the spirit of the Lord would continue to move in Samton's life and, and use him in the coming days <clears throat> we might um we've already mentioned this uh, in the q a last time but it'd be good to, to mention it again that what we're going to find about samson is that he was a very passionate man he was passionate about killing philistine men and he he does it <laughs> uh, quite frequently and quite effectively but he was equally passionate about loving Philistine women. And of course, that was his downfall. He was a strong man physically, but a weak man morally. But another practical lesson that we want to get before we finish this little section is for many a believer that's raised in a Christian home, saved as a child, we we wonder uh, it, it's it's hard to you know kind of sense um, their any transformation in their lives partly because they're uh, you know I think of my my children and uh, the 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 use of the the wooden spoon and uh, uh, the, the the restrictions of the home they didn't have a lot of opportunity. Uh, to do wild things, right? They were kind of, in a sense, hemmed in. And so uh, sometimes it's hard to tell uh, if a child who makes a profession early is really saved because there's no radical change. There's no tremendous testimony of, uh, now it is a tremendous test, don't, don't miss it, but no, you know, no dramatic story of, you know, I was a, a, an ax murderer and then I got saved. None of that kind of stuff. Uh, they've not really had that opportunity. Uh, no 180 degree turnabouts. So how can we know the reality of his or her salvation? And I believe that we get a little clue here. The spirit of the Lord began to move in Samson. And I really believe that when uh, somebody raised in a Christian home, not had opportunity to do kind of wicked, despicable things, but how do we know that they're really the Lord's? Well, I be believe that the Spirit of God begins to move them. And how do we know that he's beginning to move them? Well, they begin to be concerned about things like believers' baptism. That's an evidence of the Spirit of God is beginning to move them. They begin to be exercised about assembly fellowship, uh, wanting to make the assembly their own, no longer just their parents' meeting, but they want it to be theirs. Uh, when they start to witness to others and testify, of whom they are and who they serve. When they start to, uh, if they're young men, to share at the Lord's Supper, uh, and um, when they begin to get exercised at praying at the prayer meeting, when they start earnestly to seek to know how to use their gift, when the Spirit of God begins to move them into a life of service as opposed to a life of self-centeredness. The Spirit of God begins to move them in the home, too, uh, to be more helpful, to be a contributor rather than a sponger, uh, to, to offer to help in doing dishes, to clean up and, and clean their rooms to, uh, without being told everything, to take responsibility. And so 
uh, there's ways that we can sense that the spirit of God is beginning to move. And I remember my uh, son, James, and I suppose he was probably 12. He'd been baptized. He'd asked to come into the assembly. And I remember you sat behind us and this particular Lord's Day morning, he got up and he shared something at the Lord's Supper and his voice hadn't broken yet. And my immediate thought is there's a sister got up and I was getting ready to move in. And then I realized it's my boy. And it was so encouraging to see that personal exercise, the spirit of the Lord beginning to move. And so perhaps a little clue uh, when we know that somebody saved as a young child, raised in a Christian home, how do we know that they're really saved? It's when the spirit of the Lord begins to move them. And certainly the spirit of God began to move. By the way, I, we should be praying that the spirit of God will begin to move again in many of our assemblies, uh, that we might sense the spirit of God working in the meetings, in the gospel meetings, uh, in the prayer meeting, the spirit of God moving and exercising people uh, to really cry out to God. Oh, how we need to pray in these days, in these days like the days of judges, that we'll see evidence that the spirit of God is beginning to move. And oh, when the spirit of God begins to move, things will happen. Victories will be accomplished. The enemy will experience defeat and great things will happen. So that leads us nicely uh, into chapter 14. And we're going to see a, down, a little bit of a downward spiral in the life of Samson. In fact, we're going to see five downward journeys. And so I want you just to notice as we uh, look at the text, this uh, the reference of going down. Uh, it's just interesting to, to notice phrases in the scriptures. And so chapter 14, verse 1, and Samson went down to Timnath. Okay, verse 5, then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath. Verse 7, and he went down and taught with a woman, and she pleased Samson well. Verse 10, so his father went down to the woman. And then verse 19, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went down to Ashkelon. And so <clears throat> it's very easy when we look at chapter 14 to take, be taken up with Samson and lose sight of the Lord in all that's going on. And so we've got to remind ourselves that he appeared to Manoah and his wife. He initiated this whole thing. And here in this chapter, the Lord is revealing something that was hidden from Samson and his parents. And it's a key to understanding the events that followed. And that key is given to us in verse 4. Notice verse 4. It says, his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he saw an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. And so even though Samson, as a Nazarite, is going to make some bad choices, nevertheless, God, in his sovereignty, is going to overrule it for good. And maybe Samson meant it for evil. Maybe he didn't take his Nazarite vow quite as seriously as he ought to have done. But God is going to use it for good. And that was not hidden. It was hidden completely. In fact, you can sense as we go through this chapter, perhaps the incredible disappointment uh, that Sonny was bringing to mom and dad after such high hopes and uh, there's a lot of kind of sense of disappointment here, I'm sure. And yet God is at work. God is working because he had an occasion against the Philistines. He sought to use it as an occasion against the Philistines. And we mustn't lose sight of the sovereignty of God in working in our world. Even when things don't look like they're going in a good direction, God can still be at work and still accomplishing his purposes. 
And so the Lord was seeking an opportunity. He was uh, seizing the opportunities in a sense. The days were evil. And we're reminded for us to redeem the time because the days are evil. And so <clears throat> the Lord is sovereign. It doesn't mean that he approved of Samson's actions in any way and his relationship with the Philistines. The word of God is clear uh, in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament uh, that a child of God uh, should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. There's absolutely clarity about this, and yet God is even able to bring good out of the most unpromising circumstances. And so the sin of Samson was not of the Lord, but the deliverance wrought by it was of the Lord. Not the evil, but the good elicit, elicited from it was of the Lord. And so we need to understand that. God is able to make the wrath of man to praise him. Psalm 76, verse 10. And we, we can say this, God is definitely never the author of sin. I think that's important for us to understand that. Never is he the author of sin. But in his sovereignty, he's able to overrule circumstances for his glory. And we think of that great story of Joseph and the sin of his brethren. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And isn't it wonderful that the Lord can even use people's evil actions and still turn it out for his good? Uh, what better example can you have at the cross? Wicked hands have taken and slain, <laughs> but God turned it around and made it a great blessing. Even satanic hordes surrounding the cross, thinking that they were winning a great victory. And yet God turned the whole thing around and used it in a glorious way that's impacted our lives to this very hour. And so, again, we must have confidence uh, of uh, God's working. Now, again, just a note on the sovereignty of God. It doesn't mean that uh, God has takes away freedom of choice from individuals. Uh, he doesn't make Samson fall in love with Philistine women. But what it shows is that God is able to give individuals free choice, free will to do these things that are contrary to his will, and he's still able to overrule in the affairs of men and take men's choices, even bad ones, and still work it out for his ultimate purpose. And to me, that's more worthy of worship than a God who controls every little movement. You know, he's kind of this global Game Boy player who's manipulating everything and doesn't allow free will. We're just robots just doing what he tells us. I mean, to me, that's, that's, uh, that's no glory to be a, a global Game Boy player, but to allow people free choice and free will and still able to turn it around and work it for his own glory and for his own purposes. And so there are some journeys in this chapter. And the first journey we read is in verse one. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw the woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. So it's, it's about four miles from his home in Zora. Uh, it was allotted to the tribe of Dan uh, in the past. And so it shouldn't have been a Philistine city in the first place if the tribe of Dan had have done their work properly if you look at joshua 19 and verse 40 joshua 19 and verse 40 it says and the seventh lot came out for the tribe of the children of dan according to their families verse 43 and elon and tim natha that's our tim nath that's mentioned here and ekron and so it was part of the allotment that had been given to Dan. But we recognize, uh, again, from our own study of the Book of Judges, that Dan failed miserably in claiming their inheritance. Verse 34 of chapter 1, the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. And so the Philistines controlled the city that was really part of Dan's heritage. And yet, according to Hebrews 11, and we don't want to lose sight of this, uh, 
uh, Hebrews 11, let's just look at it, just remind ourselves. In verse 32, we have to be reminded that we're talking about a man of faith. Uh, and what shall I more say, for the time would fail to tell me of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. Now, I, I just wonder, by the time we get done finishing Samson's life, how many of us, if we were right in Hebrews 11, would have put him there? How many of us would have called Lot righteous lot in second peter i doubt any of us would and so the wonderful thing is that even in failure god still sees when there's faith in the heart of an individual and it's a wonderful thing to be assured of that and so samson was a man of faith but he certainly wasn't a faithful man he's a man of faith but not a faithful man he was unfaithful to his parents teaching and he was unfaithful to his Nazarite vow and to the laws of the Lord. His downward steps will demonstrate his disregard for these influences in his life. And the consequences, of course, for him as an individual uh, would be clear. Uh, he's going to lose his sight. Uh, <clears throat> notice it begins with an emphasis on sight. It says he went down to Timnath and saw a woman. <laughs> and so it begins with sight. It's going to end with him losing his sight because his eyes got him into a lot of trouble. Uh, he wasn't taking heed uh, to that lovely little song that we have in Sunday school. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. But the father up above is looking down in love. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. He wasn't very careful about what his eyes were seeing. And we need to be careful about what our eyes see. We need to make a covenant with our eyes, like Job, that we do not look on a woman to lust after her. But certainly... Uh, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> we certainly want to be uh, clear uh, that we do not um, uh, allow our eyes to be wandering eyes. And so he saw something that he shouldn't see. He saw this woman, a daughter of the Philistines. And so he saw a woman. And of course, um, the lust of the eyes kicked in. He saw this woman. He was attracted to this woman. And, uh, <clears throat> and so uh, the, the lust of the eyes, one of the things we got to watch out for, beware the lust of the eyes. He was walking by sight, not by faith at this moment for sure. He saw this Philistine woman, and he was clearly smitten by her. He is completely smitten by this woman. And so um, he's in the wrong place in the first place when he sees this woman. He's going down to Philistine territory. He's in the wrong place physically, and he's in the wrong place spiritually as well. And there are places that Christians ought not to be. And if they go to the wrong places, they'll be confronted with wrong things. And certainly this is what he does. And he ends up making wrong choices. And so, again, we've got to be careful, not only what we see, but careful where we go. Because it can get us into a lot of trouble. And it can end up making wrong choices. Everything about the proposed relationship was wrong everything about it and yet notice verse two he came up and told his father and his mother now, i want you to notice the language of that he, he, he didn't come he, he tells his parents fair play to him at least he tells them uh, at least that's a good thing but he he didn't seek their counsel it says he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistine. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Uh, you wonder, uh, because he was this special child, and yes, he was certainly not allowed wine and strong drink, but you wonder, did he get spoiled a little bit <laughs> from his mom and dad? You Because know? he's this special child, you see, and... An only child and a special child. 
and he's used to getting what he wants. And so he says, get this woman for me. She pleases me well. And so he certainly is not in any way seeking their blessing. He's not seeking their approval. He's not seeking their counsel. He's demanding. He told his father and his mother, said, I've seen a woman. And this is, we got to really watch out for this, that sometimes when the lust of the eyes kicks in, it's followed by self-will. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Even if it's against all godly counsel or whatever, there's this determination. I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to do this. And <clears throat> certainly we're going to see that that is the case with Samson. But we're going to have to wait till next time for the rest of the story because our time has gone. And again, great lessons, lessons for the home, uh, lessons for all of us about be careful where we go and be careful what we see. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.